to Sonar21.com podcast. Mark today on your calendars, January 28th, 2024, on the East Coast of the United States. Current time is roughly 5.45 p.m. Uh, if you were in Asia, it's early morning, the 29th. Today marks the start of the expansion of the war in the Middle East one that is going to lead the United States down a road that frankly is a dead end, a road to war that the United States cannot win. And yet, notwithstanding that fact, the emotions on the U.S. side are running high. The demands, bipartisan demands, to attack Iran are being made repeatedly, not just by the usual characters like Uh, Lindsey Graham, uh, but uh, others who in the past have been a little more measured. The United States lives in a fantasy world when it comes to its use of military power. We hearken back to the days of the first attack on Iraq uh, in 1991, and then later in 2003, you know, shock and awe, talk about shock and awe. And the U.S. public has become accustomed to seeing the U.S. launch airstrikes on basically defenseless countries, countries that had no means to fight back, no active air force, no uh, sound air defense system. And so we've convinced ourselves that because we can beat up kids in wheelchairs, that we're a mixed martial artist, that we're a world-class fighter, and we're not. We're discovering that, or it's being shown to us, but the United States has yet to come to grips with it, with what's taking place in Yemen. The Houthis, a third-rate, third-world country, have fought the United States and the United Kingdom to a standstill. They have effectively blockaded U.S., U.K., and Israeli ships from going to or from Israel. Every other ship is welcome to pass. Just the United States, the United Kingdom, and uh, Israel are being prevented. And the United States, the United Kingdom, despite dropping a million dollars worth of bombs on Yemen and blowing up sand pits and rocks and cactus and other plants, they're achieving nothing. They are not stopping the Houthis. They have not destroyed their stock of weapons, nor is the United States or the, the United Kingdom in a position to invade Yemen, conquer the country, and take control of those weapons, simply out of the question. Neither country has the military strength to do so, but despite that, they continue to pretend that they are all powerful, that they are the supreme military power in the world, and that all other nations must bend the knee before the United States. The United States is in for a rude awakening. The events of today were reported as a drone striking a base, a U.S. base in Jordan. (laughs) Why it's in Jordan, you've got to ask yourself, uh, what, what business does the United States have being there? But that's another question. But it's supposedly a drone that struck and killed three Uh, U.S. military personnel and wounded over 25. That raises a real question about was it actually a drone? Uh, If you've watched any of the footage coming out of Telegram channels with respect to Ukraine and the special operation there with Russia and both Ukraine firing drones at each other, we've never seen a single drone carry a warhead of such uh, power that it could kill three people and wound 25 others. Maybe if they were all tied together uh, in a boat, uh, you know, perhaps that could achieve it. But there's something odd about this, which I suspect once the word comes out, it's going to prove to be uh, some kind of ballistic missile or cruise missile, but uh, something with a much larger warhead. Uh, The target, reportedly, according to friends uh, that I've heard from, was a barracks, They got the U.S. soldiers while they were sleeping or while they're in their barracks. Now, the United States, the way this is being 
played in the United States is that we have been unjustly attacked. This is an act of terrorism. The United States has Alzheimer's. We ignore the fact that we killed Soleimani, a member of their armed forces, uh, that we also killed recently. We're behind a strike uh, that took out another senior IRGC commander and that we've been coordinating with Israel and carrying out similar assassinations. The United States seems to believe that it can go out, kill anyone, attack anyone, launch drones on anyone, and as long as we believe we're in the right, it's okay for us to do it. But if some other country has the audacity to push back and to hit us in the same way, oh my God, they have crossed the red line, and now we're going to react. And this is where it gets very interesting. I have a very good friend, a Navy SEAL. He was in charge of the floating naval base in the Persian Gulf back in 1987-88. And at that time, there was a, what was called the oil escort operation. Iranian ships at the time were laying mines. Uh, the U.S. set up this floating naval base, uh, headed up with uh, Navy SEALs, and uh, were able to basically stop and end the threat from Iran in laying those mines and trying to disrupt traffic in the Persian Gulf. Uh, during the course of that uh, event, the, several Iranian gunboats attacked the Hercules barge one night, and uh, the U U.S. Navy SEALs are in a full-fledged battle. They sunk uh, the gunboats that Iran sent out. I made an interesting discovery at the time. They were using Stinger missiles that had been provided to them by Oliver North, uh, formerly of the Reagan administration. Now, this was both a reminder that during the 1980s, the United States played a very duplicitous policy with respect to Iran. On the one hand, we declared Iran a terrorist state. And Iran was involved with attacks. We called them terrorism, but they were attacks of military targets and diplomatic targets in Lebanon. They blew up a Marine, the U.S. Marine barracks, as it was known, and then uh, also blew up the U.S. Embassy and the U.S. Embassy annex in 1983 and 1984. Um, these attacks, as the United States liked to pretend, were unprovoked. But the reality was the United States had been shelling Hezbollah positions in the Bekaa Valley, and this was Iran striking back in retaliation. So this, this is not the first time that we've ever seen a retaliation. Uh, but during the 1980s, the United States continued to supply through, via Israel weapons to Iran, even though we had Iran as a terrorist state. So you can excuse some of the folks in the Middle East for being confused about what U.S. policies are, what their objectives are. Uh, because we ended up playing both sides of the fence. Which brings us to today. The United States has continued to play both sides of the fence. The United States and the United Kingdom since uh, 2012 have been involved with a covert act effort to arm radical Islamists, in Syria with the purpose of overthrowing the government of Bashir al-Assad. At the same time, the United States proclaimed that its real mission in Syria was to fight some of the very Islamists that we were arming. Now, it's true that we did uh, focus some attacks on ISIS, and gee, guess who else considers ISIS an enemy? Well, that would be Iran. But repeatedly from the United States side, you hear nothing about working with Iran to destroy ISIS. You hear about the United States wanting to basically attack Iran. And that is a subject that has come up frequently, going back really almost 20 years, uh, where I know that the CIA was actively involved uh, in, a, in a plan to attack Iran around 2005, 2006. Uh, I know that thanks to a friend who was involved with that task force, and once he saw what they were up to, said, no, nah, he wanted to go do something else, which he did. Uh, but uh, so this is not, this desire to attack Iran is not new. The problem is the United States lives with the illusion, the fantasy, the magical belief 
that we can launch attacks against Iran and on Iranian territory now, and that there's nothing Iran can do to fight back or to stop us. Up to this point, the attacks by these so-called Iranian proxy groups that have been attacking U.S. military bases in Syria, in Iraq, now in Jordan, these groups have been carrying that out on behalf of the Palestinians because of the U.S. support in providing Israel with the weapons that are being used to commit genocide in Palestine and in Gaza. Uh, the murder of women and children, wanton murder of women and children by the Israelis. So these groups have been targeting U.S. military bases. One of those bases, curiously, is uh, in Kurdish territory, located adjacent to a Conoco oil facility. Well, guess what? The oil that's pumped from that ground, it gets sold to an entity that takes it through Turkey. So the Turks get to take a cut. And then that oil ultimately makes its way to Israel. So the U.S. military presence in Syria and in Iraq, which is being described as to fight ISIS and to fight terrorism, that's bullshit. Pure unadulterated bullshit. Uh, these military units are there to protect uh, oil interests and uh, ostensibly to protect Israel. That's what they're there for. And that is why they are being attacked. Yet up to this point, the attacks have not been what I would call serious. They've not been sustained. They've not been in such a, uh, a concentration that it really put the lives of most of the personnel at those bases at risk. That's not going to change. Uh, the attack today was a signal that Iran, number one, uh, I don't think Iran was necessarily behind this, but whoever launched it, they launched a, a, a missile of significant size that it was able to uh, destroy a barracks and in the process kill three and leave 25 at least wounded, maybe more. And now the United States is insisting that it's going to retaliate. Okay. Before they do that, my advice would be close down your bases, America, in Syria, in Iraq, in Jordan, in Israel, in Qatar, at al udid in Ethiopia. Close them down. Get your personnel out. Otherwise, if you leave your personnel in place, and you launch attacks on Iran and on Iranian territory. Iran will retaliate. Iran has the capability to retaliate. Iran has missiles that can reach all of those bases and missiles with much more powerful warheads than these uh, puny ass drones that have been striking. We're talking major missile configurations that can reach easily to Israel, can reach into Turkey if necessary. Uh, Iran, if attacked, as the United States is talking about it, is going to respond. At that point, we're going to be in viewing what I'll call a lethal tennis match, volley back and forth. But instead of a green ball bouncing over a net, we're having missiles flying back and forth. And civilians are going to be killed. Civilians on both sides. I do not rule out the possibility that this could entail Iran unleashing a terrific missile barrage on Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv, had, you know, they've complained about Hamas rockets in the past, and these homemade rockets have really been, in, you know, they've caused a little bit of damage, but they've not caused mass casualties. We're talking now the potential for mass casualty events in Israel beyond anything that they've ever seen in their 75 years of history. This thing is poised now to spin out of control because Iran now has a strategic defensive agreement in place, at least uh, de facto, with Russia. In the fact, it has been conducting joint military exercises with Russia and China going back more than four years. So this is not just Iran on its own. The United States has enjoyed the luxury of carrying out illegal attacks against other countries, invading Iraq without a UN 
uh, resolution, uh, carrying out acts of military force without even the approval of the U.S. Congress, such as the recent strikes in Yemen. Now the United States looks like it's going to overreach and overstep in the heat of politics that are driving this domestically. Joe Biden, who's already addled and demented and doesn't know where he is half the time, can't afford, in his view or the view of his uh, advisors, to be perceived as weak and as vacillating. So he's going to act in, quote, what he views as strength. But the strength that he's going to unleash is to use military force against a country that can fight back. Up to this point, we have not seen Iran enter in directly uh, with uh, the, the United States. The United States spends a lot of time blaming Iran uh, for the actions of Hamas and Hezbollah and these other entities. Uh, while they share uh, certain common interests and certain common values, doesn't mean that they're necessarily the puppets or under the control of Tehran. In fact, uh, in the case of Hezbollah, Hezbollah has been known to sort of been going its own way uh, now for more than 30 years. Still has friendly relations with Iran, still will have exchanges of military technology and training, but it, it's become its own person. It's grown up. It's no longer a child uh, under the tutelage of Iran. It, Hezbollah has become its own entity. I don't venture to predict what Russia or China will do in this uh, situation. Uh, I can assure you that Saudi Arabia is going to be alarmed. Uh, if the United States is attacked, particularly if it's attacked from any base in either Saudi Arabia or Qatar, and in Qatar it's particularly an issue because that's where Al Udid, that's the largest U.S. military base uh, in the region, and uh, it's a it's a headquarters for Central Command and a lot of its air operations. Uh, if any air operations are launched from or directed from that facility, it will become a ripe target, and it is vulnerable. And whatever air defense systems the United States thinks it has in place will be inadequate to stop what Iran will fire. It is time now for cooler heads to prevail, but I don't know where they are. This thirst, this lust for war has seized the American political elite like COVID. It's a fever, it's an infection, and it's deadly. Right now, I think we're going to be witnessing in the coming days, the United States taking action that ultimately is not going to lead, leave the United States in a position of power in a position of dominance, but it's going to weaken the United States. It's going to embroil the United States in a long-term conflict that it cannot win. And why can it not win it? Because we're not willing to mobilize 2 million people. We're not willing to mobilize the, all the remaining industrial capability in the United States and devote it entirely to war. Because to do so would mean, instead of producing things that would be making money for the capitalists here, we would be taxing people, forcing sacrifices in order to gem generate weapons to pursue a war against people that have not been attacking the United States per se, except where the United States puts its military forces in other countries, thinking that it has the right to be there, the right to to do whatever it wants in terms of launching drone strikes against people that we declare as terrorists, as high value targets. No judicial process, no due process. The United States gets to decide who lives and who dies, does so arbitrarily. And frankly, a lot of countries are now saying, no more, no mas, niet. It's got to stop. I'm Larry Johnson. You can follow me at sonar21.com. Thank you for listening.